Welcome, and thank you for attending this live Thursdays at noon community event. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. We recognize the long history of First Nations and Métis people on this land and show respect to them today. We acknowledge our neighbors, the Wata Mohawks, and the First Nations of Moose Deer Point, Shwanaga, Wasaksing, Magnetowan, Henvey Inlet, Nipissing, and O'Keese. In this week's live virtual community event, we are talking about the opioid crisis. I don't think there's anyone who's not been affected by this tragedy unfolding in our community on a daily basis. Families are losing children, children are losing parents, and it seems grief is everywhere. Our own Sarah Law wrote about our discussion today, and we salute her bravery as she brought the topic home, writing about her childhood without a father, as his heroin addiction led to his incarceration when she was just two years old. She never saw him again. Last year, Canada reported over 6,000 opioid deaths, but in fact, it is impossible to know how many more fatal overdoses go unreported. In our own newsroom, we have known this heartbreaking loss intimately. The opioid crisis is part of a greater web of need in Perry Sound, Muskoka. It's a crisis of mental health, of poverty, and a lack of safe and accessible housing, among other issues. Experts agree trauma is all too often the breeding ground for vulnerability to addiction. This land is home to nine First Nation communities and the generational trauma forced on Indigenous people by colonialism is really just now starting to be understood by Canadians of settler heritage. Are Indigenous people getting the support they need to survive and come out of this crisis? Naloxone kits, safe consumption sites, prevention and intervention. What kinds of solutions will work for our community? Police are often the first on the scene of opioid related tragedy and the first line of defense against those who would seek to profit from the business of illegal drugs. Last year, we headed up a special report on guns and drugs traveling along the highways of Ontario and that project was spurred by the frequency with which our newsroom was hearing about traffic stops where drug dealers from the south were fully armed and in our backyards. The violent crime fueling the crisis seems to demand a criminal justice response, and we are concerned about our neighbors who wear the badge and put their lives on the line on our highways. So what about decriminalization? Would that take the illegal big business and the violence that comes with it out of the equation? Is this a criminal justice issue or a health issue? Clearly it's both. So today we have, do we have OPP Constable Samantha Bigley? I see you, I see you, yay. Thank you for joining us. We have Provincial Constable Samantha Bigley of the Bracebridge OPP, and we have Connie Foster, Mental Health and Addictions Program Lead at the West Perry Sound Health Center Rural Nurse, pra nurse Practitioner-Led Clinic, serving Moose Deer Point, and her co-lead on the Rapid Addiction Treatment Team, Point of Barrel Nurse Practitioner, Jared Bonus. Um, can we begin with Samantha, Samantha, can you tell us, Constable Bigley, um, what is your perception of what is going on now? S Sam is fine. Just Sam is fine. <laughs> Sam. Uh, officer Sam. I was a school resource officer for years. It's Officer Sam seems to be the name that stuck the most. Um, it is certainly, um, it's, it's a, there's a real growing um, issue of concern in our communities and our small communities are are no different than larger communities just proportionately. We, uh, together with the Muskoka Drug Strategy, back in 2017 now, we ran a series of opioid information forums um, 
and many of all of our partners were there from the um, Ontario Addiction Treatment Center to public health to uh, CMHA and our, our school resources teams um, all participated in this opioid forum. That was 2017 when the issue was starting to come to the forefront of being a public health crisis. Um, and that was our first opportunity to see the influence that naloxone might have in saving lives in our community and it was shortly after that that we began to with our naloxone distribution program so with bracebridge opp and up in huntsville we pair up with addictions team through cmha and Try, basically, it's a door-to-door -door program, trying to distribute enough naloxone out into the community as possible. Uh, just so that it's readily available, that if someone comes across a crisis, um, so often an opioid overdose will be accidental um, in the event that someone, and perhaps somebody who has a, a legitimate prescription, uh, may accidentally overdose on their own prescription. Um, or also, of course, through recreational use. That demand for naloxone um, is sort of something that I kind of use as a measure of how our community is faring. And we are handing out more naloxone now than ever. So um, I'm also part of the uh, outreach team, mental health outreach team with CMHA and the um, crisis worker that comes along with me in the cruiser brings naloxone with her now. And so every opportunity where we can get naloxone further out into the community, we do. But the increasing demand is, is I think the public would be surprised at the number of people that are looking to replenish those supplies of naloxone in the community. And so that speaks to um, it's working. I mean, people' lives are being saved, but the struggle is still very much there. So it's a part of an ongoing effort on our part and our partnership with CMHA to continue to get the message out there, get the naloxone out there, and um, also promote the Good Samaritan Put Over Those Act. Well. Mm -hmm. Sam, from a, from a criminal justice standpoint, I, I have heard uh, repeatedly in the last few years from folks like JP that, that the police are not really interested in arresting people on possession charges, that, that it is a real awareness that this is a, a, a health issue and that police are very interested in arresting folks uh, who, are, who are profiting and who are bringing crime into the area but not so much uh, the, the people who are actually victims of, of the crisis. Is that, has that been your experience? Uh, it certainly, the people who struggle with addictions um, are, um, are, are victims of their addiction and to be able to uh, bring to justice or interrupt the people who are profiting from people who are struggling like that is, is definitely a goal of our community street crime unit in particular um, and drug enforcement units. Interrupting people who are, who are making like so much money and causing so much destruction. Um, they don't care about the end user, the people who are struggling in our communities, our neighbors and our friends and family. So, uh, I would agree with that, that the priority isn't to penalize the person who's struggling the most. It is to get at the distributors. But it is, I sort of make it as kind of akin to the whack-a-mole. As long as there is that demand, as long as there are people who are struggling and, and seeking as they're dealing with that struggle, there will be a dealer. So... I turn to our friends in the community and our other supports in healthcare. How are we dealing with people who are struggling? How are mm -hmm. we able to support and um, offer that change into wellness when it's time and when that person's ready? So it's such a community approach that's needed. We're happy to do our part and try and interpret that criminal element. Um, but the demand, what are we doing about the demand? Mm hmm because as long as there are vulnerable people, there will be predators. What is that Good Samaritan piece? What, what does that actually mean? Like if I'm someplace and, 
and I'm maybe a person who, who, who is a victim of this addiction, and my friend is overdosing. What does that Good Samaritan piece mean? The goal behind the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act is to, um, to try to not have a criminal penalty be the reason that someone doesn't call 911. So it, if it is a situation where there are people gathered and there is obviously illegal possession of drugs, um, people will not be charged criminally in those circumstances. So the goal is to please save that life. If that's the priority. The Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act prevents those that are also there from being charged criminally. Okay, that is good information. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Okay, so um, Connie Foster, can you give us your perspective and experience? Okay, well, definitely I feel it is um, a public health crisis due to the amount of deaths that are lost in this, what I um, bring forward as a chronic relapsing brain disease. So along the spectrum of a chronic disease like diabetes, um, so, for example, in BC, the opioid crisis-related deaths um, have increased with the onset of COVID 140 to 160%. Here in our area, I think it's um, averaging around 40 to 60% with um, overdoses and deaths because of COVID. So, um, when looking at that um, from a chronic disease perspective, if uh, we had people dying from diabetes, and left, right, and center, then we'd certainly do something about it from a public health perspective. Um, and it would definitely be portrayed in the media more. So I feel that it's not portrayed enough in the media about the overdoses and the deaths that are going on in the province of Ontario and even just in our area. I think that that would be really important to bring that information out to the public and um, so that there could be more um, knowledge and education and um, perhaps even coalitions going on in our region to address the crisis and the overdose and the death. And if we think about um, lack of understanding um, from addiction and substance use disorder, it typically, like you were mentioning, stems from the root cause of trauma. So 70 to 90% 90 of, 90 of people with a substance use disorder have an underlying trauma, usually stemming from childhood abuse, sexual abuse, neglect in childhood, so in all reality, we really do have a trauma crisis and we have a trauma crisis worldwide and we need to have, uh, so that leads to ineffective coping and numbing of this pain. And uh, of course, using the substances that are available and with COVID even there's less access to the drugs of choice that the people are looking for and um, turning to fent fentanyl, unfortunately, which is um i think 40 percent higher or 100 percent more potent than morphine so we have an access issue a trauma issue ineffective um uh, treatment access for example with covid access to treatment shut completely right down so with our program jared and i experienced an increased rate of community-based um um, treatment access to our program to the RAM RCAT program here in Perry Sound at the hospital and um, we've got to the point that we had to stop accepting referrals and um, yeah so that was really um, a big issue with COVID is looking at our capacity we offer our services through the West Perry Sound Health Center nurse practitioner led clinic and um, we're doing it, uh, we have minimal funding, and at one point we were doing it just in kind, um, knowing that there was an issue and we were trying to help with that issue and educate uh, primary care providers and the community members. I'm also the co-lead of the Perry Sound Drug Strategy. So looking at initiatives um, to uh, partner with other organizations in the community uh, to bring forward uh, these strategies like the, the harm reduction, naloxone, um, different approaches and even one area that we would like to bring forward in the fall is just bringing that awareness to primary care providers to screen their patients in when they come in for health care screen them around their use their alcohol use too we have to remember alcohol is still the number one abused drug out there and access is very it's legal so we need to think about all these different pieces of access effect access to effective treatment People are dying waiting on lists, getting into treatment. Treatment is one of the number one barriers, effective treatment as well. 
um, in our province and I guess all across North America and the world. I mean, we hear of these same issues everywhere, that getting into treatment, it's costly. And um, again, people are dying waiting for that treatment and that's unfortunate. And we do need to put some strategies in place to save lives. Our lives do matter. And one thing that to bring across um, with substance use disorder or addiction, it is treatable and people can recover from it if we intervene with the right strategies at the right time. Mm -hmm. It brings to mind what you're saying, the, the COVID crisis itself, the, the will behind mobilizing the entire planet to protect people um, from a health crisis. Yes. And where is the will to mobilize the planet behind this health crisis? Right behind the, 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 the opioid and the trauma health crisis, um, because it's it is also huge. Um, okay, well, thank you for that, Jared. Um, what 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 can you what can you add to to this to begin? Thanks a lot, Pamela. So to start off, um, I'd say for me when I was trained, we were kind of taught that substance use disorder kind of affects three various areas, if you will. There are definite medical components. Um, so for example, for opiate use disorder, um, responding to opiate agonist therapy to treat cravings and withdrawals or, or naloxone as, as Officer Sam was mentioning to reverse overdoses. Um, so there's definitely a medical component uh, that needs to be addressed. And we have some actually, as Connie was saying, some very hopeful and, and very beneficial treatments to offer patients. And the second consideration is the mental health or concurrent disorder uh, consideration. So as, as Connie was, was saying earlier, uh, there's an overwhelming body of evidence that suggests that addiction and uh, mental health uh, challenges or diagnoses often are very closely linked. And when we're trying to address uh, the situation or the, or the patient, uh, being able to consider the mental health uh, realities and access to services so as Connie was mentioning, you know, the, uh, the wait times for treatment, one of the things that popped into my mind was the wait times for counseling. Um, and we have our system working exceedingly hard right now uh, to try to meet a surging demand of, of requests for mental health services. Uh, and then there's the third part as well, uh, which is the community realities. Uh, and so for me, one of the things that, you know, I talk about with my patients is that the things that kind of contribute to overall health, so housing, education, income, being able to afford prescription medications that, you know, we would prescribe. And, and I think that if we can, if we come together as a, as a community or as a system to try to view um, substance use disorder in any one particular area and forget about the other two, um, then often, you know, we might have solutions or things that come forward that don't necessarily consider the full picture. And, and that's why I'm really you know, excited to be part of, of opportunities like this to say, you know, what does it look like for our community strategy? How do these social determinants or the realities of where we live uh, in Northern Ontario or Muskoka, Perry Sound, how do those come to bear? And what does it look like for the people with lived experiences who are actually having to access these services? Can they do it? So I'll use myself as, a, as an example. It was really, really silly. I was trying to provide care to my patients and nobody would pick up the phone for the first month of the pandemic. And then I realized, because a patient told me, he said, you're calling from a private number. I, I don't, I don't want to pick up the phone. I don't know who it is. And there's all sorts of things like that, that unless we're engaging with people with lived experience, uh, you know, and I have to say, thanks. Like, no wonder no one's taken my call. I have to make another arrangement. So having ways to consider what does the lived experience look like for people with a substance use challenge? What does it mean for their families? What does it mean for their, their communities? And I think as, as Officer Sam was saying earlier, uh, the word collaboration um, and collaboration between organizations uh, to involve our law enforcement partners, our CMHA mental health partners. Uh, what about our, our social services and our home and housing uh, boards as well? Um, and then having kind of that community collaborative strategy that really reflects the local landscape for where we are and where we find our patients. Mm -hmm. It's a web. And I can only think that this uh, COVID-led real estate boom um, and what it has done to an all uh, an area already in crisis in terms of affordable housing, you know, so there's no housing stock. Um, it's only going to make things worse. And, and you said that COVID itself, that you've seen such an increase. 
Um, some comments from our, our community members so far. Uh, Brent Brown says further to Officer Sam's point, I love that Officer Sam has taken off as, as your moniker for this discussion, Samantha. Uh, <laughs> Officer Sam's point about stopping those that are grossly profiting from these addictions, the pharmaceutical companies producing them should be accountable. They're profiting from the kits and methadone too. The production needs to become illegal, I guess, of the original opioids. Uh, legalizing the drug, drug simply makes their business even more profitable. So holding pharmaceutical companies to account, that, that, that is certainly something that we've heard discussed. And we, we've also, um, in, in articles that we've done, it's been noted that one of the biggest groups uh, that, that, that we see of, of folks who are vulnerable are the people in the trades. And we seem to have two different uh, job options in Muskoka. You can be in the service industry or in the construction industry. So all of these people in the trades, they get injured, they get prescribed opioids, and, uh, and then they end up on an addiction uh, uh, track. And, and so I'm going to have to say, I, I agree, there is a piece there for holding pharmaceutical companies uh, to account. Um, lives, so Brent continues, lives have been destroyed from a seemingly simple pain prescription for post-surgery or accidents. Teeth, we've heard about kids, kids after their, after their now, it seems mandatory wisdom teeth removal. Um, um, the highly addictive properties are widely known. The prescription and production of these drugs must be stopped. There were and still are better alternatives. Our doctors need to be held accountable and be socially responsible to no longer perpetuate this crisis. Does, do, do, does anyone from our team want to talk about that? Want to talk about the prescription drug path? Bonnie or Jared or Samantha, do you have any, any comment on that? Sure, sure. I guess I, I can start off. Um, so, so I think the, the need for responsible, judicious prescribing of pain medication is, of course, um, paramount. And I think that's where the conversations are really, really important, because uh, we do get lots of consultations and uh, from people saying, you know, I've been on very high doses of, of pain medication, and somewhere along the way, um, it became less of a, a medication, perhaps, to help with a specific problem and more of a, a, more of a dependency that evolved over time. And I think that's where the word stigma really comes to mind for me, is how do we destigmatize the conversation about safe prescribing and what that looks like. Um, having worked with some fantastic clinicians, physicians, nurse practitioners, lots of people, I've yet to meet a single clinician that said, oh, I'm going to do this uh, to cause any form of harm to my patient. No, it's often coming from a place of wanting to alleviate you know, pain or suffering or treat you know, an issue. Um, but over time, it can escalate, and I, I'd say there's been a shift definitively that I've observed, Connie. I'd be interested to hear your perspective. A shift in the last kind of 10, 15 years to what does it look like to have non-opiate-based pain management, and how do we offer meaningful pain management uh, in order to support our patients, and, and what's the exit strategy, if you will? Uh, so there's a lot of research, um, just from my own primary care practice, that shows that in acute pain situations, you know, opiates do have a very important role to play to help people. Um, but then if that's the only tool that we, we use, then I can see how it becomes quite problematic. Um, but I would say for my own practice especially, there's been a big shift in the last, I don't know, what would you say, Connie, five, ten years towards um, non-opiate-based uh, medications and prescribing and some really interesting and innovative therapies coming out. So I would absolutely agree it's something that needs to be addressed, and I think we're seeing a shift in overall practice from clinicians. Uh, especially from younger clinicians such as myself as we're, as we're coming out into practice with what the frame of mind is for how we offer meaningful options to our patients. Thank you, Jared. Connie, did you have something to add to that? Yes. So I think um, back in the day, uh, 20, 15 to 20 years ago, it was appropriate to prescribe from a prescribing perspective an opioid. And now, you know, with new best practice guidelines, it isn't um, correct anymore unless it's for cancer pain or post three days post uh, a surgical procedure. So now there are initiatives out there to prescribers, family doctors, nurse practitioners, um, looking at how do you de-prescribe 
How do you taper off your patients off their um, substance uses and, and their prescription opioids um, that they've um, been prescribed in the past? So there is that um, uh, looking at um, including that into their practice and getting more information out how to do this deprescribing and appropriately take people ta uh, taper their patients off of their substances and um, and actually doing that um, substance use history and screening for are they using other um, substances as well because you could have a combined problem there you have your um, prescribed pain medication and now you on top of it might be using alcohol or benzodiazepines and maybe a street drug because now you've built up tolerance and that's where it often stems from too is this building of the tolerance of the um, opioid and needing to supplement with street drugs and then that just leads down that rabbit hole. Okay and 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 Officer Sam in terms of criminalization do you, do you see that or folks ending up before the courts who maybe had 10, 20, 30 years of, of, of adult life as tradespeople who, who end up falling into um, into a whole other is that something you see um not I, not really um adult like adults that have unfortunate and unknowingly probably years ago i'm not sure that the medical community fully understood uh, the long-term effect that we were going to face when dealing with say oxycodone as a uh, way to deal with physical pain what we do see is an increase in um, drug impaired driving. So the ways that sometimes substance use comes out as an effect in community is in a case where there's impaired driving and the person is impaired by drug. And that's really um, sort of the last several years where we've had the tools under the criminal code to deal with drug impaired driving. And officers have had the adequate training to do either roadside or uh, at detachment assessment for someone's level of, uh, of impairment by drug. So mm -hmm. that, not that that wasn't happening before, we just, it's been a part of this whole process of becoming aware of the effects of these um, drugs in people's systems and more and more the abundance of the illegal drug trade when it comes to fentanyl and carfentanil. So I would say okay. that that's an area where people who have never come into conflict with the law have managed their pain probably originally with legitimate prescriptions and then when their doctor tries to sort of claw back that prescription and offer some alternatives and I mean realistically like you said if you work in the trades it's a very physically demanding job and you've been managing that with opioids through a legitimate prescription your doctor takes that away then um Sometimes it just, you know, they'll, they'll seek out these illegal options to find it and in order to deal with their pain and continue to keep their life intact. So, um, so it does come out in community in different ways, not, by, not usually by way of an actual criminal charge for possessing an illegal substance, but possibly through something like impairment by drug driving. Okay, all right, thank you for that. So we also have a, a Perry Sound Man who would like to see, I just lost it. Sorry about that, folks. It was, there it is, a Perry Sound man. Would like to see a residential treatment center in the town. Sarah Bisnett uh, interviewed and, and wrote a, a story with him. Sarah, is, is, is he here today? I'm not sure. Robin, are you one of the people on the phone? Let me... Let me unmute the phones in case he is. Robin, are you with us by telephone? I guess not. Um, I, I did. Not. I did share the information. Um, I, I did do it on Tuesday when, for some reason, I was thinking it was Wednesday. <laughs> so you have a story, though, Sarah. What 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 is it that he's trying to accomplish, and 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 how can the folks here today maybe respond to that? So he um, has, he, he, he had told me that he was been helping people who have been addicted to drugs over the years by trying to get them into treatment centers and, and encouraging them 
um, to programs such as Alcoholic Anonymous or um, Drug Addicts Anonymous. He, uh, he, he, he's an attendant of Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous himself. Um, and what he would like to see in town, um, given his experience with trying to help others get into residential treatment centers for drug uh, drug addiction. Um, he wants to see a residential tr addiction treatment center in the town of Perry Sound. Um, so my question is if anyone here would know how uh, such a center could be set up within our town, what kind of, who needs to be brought on board, what funding is available, what is the need locally for a center such as that? Connie, is that something you, you could respond to? Well, definitely there is a need to have um, treatment closer to home. We do not have a lot of treatment in the local area, inpatient treatment. We do have a private center, Greenstone Muskoka Detox and Treatment Center, Recovery Center in Bala. It is private, unfortunately, so it's limited to people that have access to private funding. So if there could be a, a publicly funded treatment center locally, um, that would be um, a great initiative to undertake. It's looking for the funding um, to from the government to support this. Yeah, and just following up on what, what Connie was saying there a moment ago, you know, funding being a big thing. I think the other thing is uh, community collaboration uh, and having people from multiple sectors collaborating to create, uh, you know, a unified voice uh, for the need. Uh, one of the things that I don't know if we have time to get into is, is community-based withdrawal management. Um, one of the big challenges we've seen in the last year and a half is that a person will come to a crisis and they will reach out for help and we will do our very best. And then they'll say, I wanna to go to treatment and we'll say, okay, it's gonna be mm, six months, a year, eight months. Um, and the person's ready right now. Uh, so one of the strategies that's been emerging, which I find really innovative and exciting is it's leveraging technology. And I'm sure Connie could speak to it in more detail is mobile withdrawal services or mobile treatment services where we're utilizing our partnerships with community mental health agencies, uh, with housing initiative support to try to make patients where they're at or community members where they're at to start accessing uh, some formalized form of community-based withdrawal support. Um, and that's really an exciting initiative to me that, uh, that seems to make a lot of sense even meeting where people are at for, for patients that meet the criteria. Kristen. Hi, I just wanted to thank our uh, panelists, we'll call them, for being with us today. Um, I'm one of the court and crime reporters here uh, on our team, and I have a question that's sort of directed at all three of you. It's sort of a split question. So, um, Connie, I really like that you brought up that stat from BC. I spent a lot of time there, living there, and that's where I first encountered the opioid crisis. And something that is there that is not here are supervised uh, consumption sites. And I just wonder where the conversation is at with that. You know, we've had a lot of conversation today about preventative and reactive, um, you know, uh, solutions, should we call them, uh, treatment. Um, and so, you know, but the thing is the crisis is here in the, in the now, right? And so how can we help people truly in that moment of crisis and, uh, you know, part B is, I guess, to Sam, when you had mentioned that um, a lot of naloxone is going out into the community right now, I'm curious if that's something that's happening, um, you know, when you're attending calls and people are in need of it, or are people coming actively to you, to police or to medical uh, professionals who are giving that out, um, to sort of have that on them uh, before crisis strikes? food should start. <laughs> you go, Sam. Definitely. So it is preventative. We by now in the, are in the, the naloxone distribution program um, and with the sort of knowledge base from our partners with CMHA, um, we um, are a little bit more targeted in our distribution of naloxone in that um, we try to replenish the supply. Um, people will speak up and I hope that it speaks to sort of how that stigma is changing. When we are out and about, people will speak up and say, I, I'm the holder of naloxone for a group of people. 
people won't come to the pharmacy, public health, CMHA, they're, for whatever reason, they won't go and seek out naloxone on their own. So we know that there are people in is definitely one source people will come uh, to us looking for naloxone. Now, I should clarify that as the police, we accompany CMHA. We're not the source of the naloxone. CMHA is the source of public health. So um, they will come to us and we can bring then bring someone to them to provide or go to the pharmacy and, and help them out that way. But um, and uh, following in that strain, if an officer uses naloxone at a call for service, which happens, um, there will be a medical call if we happen to have to use naloxone. We also don't have the capacity yet to be able to replenish whatever supply might be there. So that, um, I do believe, and I don't want to misspeak, but I do believe that Muskoka EMS, the par our local paramedic service, are in a position now to distribute naloxone as well. So very rarely would we be at a medical call like that where paramedics wouldn't be. So um, they are in a position now, but my goodness, it was a little while coming as people got, organizations got their uh, policies in place in order to make that happen, but they are able to distribute that now. So I believe. Uh, so it's, we try and connect them. We try and think back officers that have been to medical calls where naloxone has been used uh, if it seems like there's a, a, that need, then they'll let me know and I can reattend with my partner from CMHA and drop off whatever is needed. And that's not just naloxone. She carries along um, safe supplies, um, kits, clean needles, whatever is going to um, promote better health. So I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Connie or Jerry, do you have a response to Kristen? Connie? Oh, I do too. Um, so I think if we're going to have a conversation around um, safe consumption sites um, for our region, we're going to definitely have to have conversations around uh, and strategies of decreasing the stigma and shame around substance use. So right from the user to the family, to the loved ones, to the community, to the healthcare providers to accept this harm reduction approach in our community. So I think that's where the conversation needs to be brought forward is um, understanding the stigma, the shame, the reasons why someone would be um, using substances and that root cause um, often being trauma and looking at it, you know, how, how deep is your pain? Looking at it from that, not you are, um, you know, a, a substance use disorder, you're addicted. Um, looking at that mind shift to be able to actually put in strategies and being open-minded to allow um, safer consumption sites and that might be the step in the right path for somebody to um, go into recovery in an abstinence mind frame um, down the road. At least they will be safer and there'll be less lives lost due to the circulating uh, fentanyl, carfentanil, lace drugs. So speaking of lost lives, has anyone heard about this? I heard in the last week and 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 uh, someone close to us uh, died, a young man um, who did have a drug addiction and uh, his, his supplier changed and the new supplier was new to the area and, and he, didn't, he didn't set out to die that night, right? He set out to do what he had been doing for quite literally years at that point. Um, but, but there was a lot more fentanyl in it and we know that that's a grain of sand um, and, and he did die. Uh, as a as a 24 year old man um so apparently there is something uh, that is being given out in in the west coast it's all brand new where where a person can test their drugs to see how much of what is in it is that something that you think we'll be seeing here anytime soon to save lives yeah, so I actually have heard about this myself where they have point of care testing so that a person can tell what's in their supply um, before it. I, I don't know um, what the feasibility is right now to roll out on a wider wider scale. I know they do have drug testing from some of my colleagues in Toronto and in larger centers. 
Um, but yeah, a really, really exciting idea, and I, I'd love to see that more readily accessible uh, so people can be aware of what's specifically in the supply. In terms of the technology, the logistics, I'm, I'm not certain where it stands at that. Connie, are you aware of any implementation? No, I'm not, but I believe this is um, something that they're implementing in BC. And um, I think that that was really reasonable um, strategy to implement in our region, especially when you think about um, dealers. So a lot of um, the issue is around access. Heroin is difficult to access, so it's being cut with something that's, you know, um, 40 to 60% more stronger. And uh, people with substance use disorder are actually afraid of fentanyl. And so the drug dealers aren't even letting them know that they're cutting it with fentanyl because they're, they're bumping up the what little of heroin that they have um, or, or hydromorph and um, not telling them that it's, it's been cut with that. It is cheaper, lighter to um, package and transport as well. So there's um, th that reason too um, around access, um, their, their drug of choice and um, the drugs that are circulating around being more powerful and not disclosed by their dealers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and in that same article, the fellow who, who runs a treatment center in the West and, and who is himself, I keep saying addicted, but addict, uh, uh, an addict, but Connie, you have a better uh, uh, term and yours is someone with substance use disorder. Right, so that would be the, the medical terminology. Right. Uh, okay, so he's someone with substance use disorder. And his feeling is that the problem won't be solved until there's political will to solve it. And there's not because people don't care about people with substance use disorder. Um, and that speaks to the stigma, that speaks to, um, to that whole mindset. We need, we need to care about our loved ones who are dying. We need to care enough to, to uh, force the political will to make all of these things that people are talking about happen. The treatment centers, um, we have folks commenting on the side, uh, the challenge to putting together a treatment center is nimbyism, so not in my backyard. Uh, and certainly we see that in all different ways throughout Perry Sound, Muskoka, what folks don't want to have in their backyard. So um, um, for me, again, this conversation has just made me even more uh, aware that it's all about political will. Change won't happen until there's movement because we all really care about the people in our community who are suffering from this disorder. Um, so we're, we're about three minutes out to, 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 to wind up. Um, perhaps each of our, our experts can give us a, just a, a quick roundup uh, to say goodbye, starting with Officer Sam. Oh, Okay, who, who do we have on the phone? I'm Robin Smith. Hi, I've Robin. I've been in a program for over 30 years. Um, I go to AA, I go to NA, I go to Al-Anon. They're very good programs. But uh, one of the problems is people got to remember addiction is a disease. They've proven it scientifically all around the world. It's a disease. But if we start saying, oh, it's because of the trauma when they're kids, if we, if we send them to the psychiatrist and deal with the trauma that's going to cure uh, there's lots of people had trauma when they're kids lots of people have been all kinds of situations that's not what makes them an addict you're either an addict or you're not an addict it's like you're either gay or you're not gay people don't turn gay people don't turn into addicts it develops it progresses over time it's either in you or it's not in you and it's in me for the my, rest of my life so i go to my meetings for the rest of my life and I enjoy mm -hmm. them. They've improved my life. But some people need treatment because they go through the withdrawals. That's why we need uh, rehab in town. And people go, yeah, I don't want it in my backyard. But these people that are using are in your backyard. They're overdosing in your backyards. I have a friend that they, they walked outside and somebody had OD'd in their backyard on Gibson Street. Um, so it's already in our backyard. So it, we're not talking about a halfway house where serial killers are are moving in uh it's nothing like that this is to help better the community not worse than the community so i the people say oh i don't want it in my backyard it's already in our backyard thank you for that comment robin yeah. and 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 it's that us and them right so i think the recognition that they were talking about us 
we're talking about our children and we're talking about our parents and our brothers and sisters and our cousins and and it is us um so um uh, officer sam do you have a final comment just uh quickly just mindful of time um i would just really like to encourage people to start to view this as um, a community um it has to be a community approach if we're going to be helpful and yep, the police definitely have a, a role to play, but when it comes to supporting and caring for the people that are struggling in our communities, we've all got to be on board with helping. And not just the social services, um, everyone. So we had an issue down um, that has cropped up a little bit here and there, but in Gravenhurst, it was very uh, public with um, needles being found at local parks. And the immediate um, response was, we need more enforcement, more enforcement, we need police there. It's like, it's not, that's certainly one part of it, but why are they there? Why are the needles there? Why are people needing to use a park? They don't have housing. There's so many facets to the issue. To help, make it, you know, help our community become healthier. Thank you. Thank you for that. Connie, do you have a final comment for us? Yes, so saving lives matters. I think we need to have access to effective treatments and programming um, throughout the province of Ontario and North America. And also um, that community-based voice um, needs to um, be increased in our area. And if anybody's interested in sitting on the Perry Sound Drug Strategy, please send me an email and um, that would be um, paramount in bringing our voices across so that uh, we can bring initiatives to Perry Sound and help come up with some resourceful solutions. Thank you and miigwech. Thank you, Connie. Jared. Yeah, thanks Pamela. So I think for me just the thing to highlight the most as we close is, is the idea of stigma and the reality of the very dangerous um, effects of stigma. Whatever we can do uh, to reduce stigma uh, and address stigma uh, is a very, very important thing to me because we have to be able to have open conversations with people and open collaboration. And if we can't have those or patients or people won't access help because they're afraid of being stigmatized, uh, then that can be an insurmountable barrier for a great many people. Uh, so I think even being mindful of how we uh, propagate stigma, what it might look like, and how we can reduce that as a community uh, when we're discussing mental health, substance use disorder, uh, and living with a substance use disorder diagnosis. Thanks. Thank you, Jared. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to uh, community members and to our expert panel. We appreciate you being here. Uh, next week, our discussion is back to school. What will that look like? Um, I do hope that you will join us next Thursday at noon. Thank you. Goodbye.